So what I want to do today is talk about applications of probability and mathematical modeling and statistics. So this is real work that I did when I was a postdoc at Brown. It was inspired by a question asked by a student who was taking mathematical statistics with me. And then it's led to a lot of very interesting connections with the baseball community. And when we have some recording malfunctions later, I will talk about some of those. So I want you to see that with the math that you're doing right now, with the stats that you're doing right now, with the programming that you're doing right now, you already have enough to be useful. Right. So I always dedicate this talk to my great uncle, Luke Lomberg, who told me when I was a little kid and asked him, well, I live long enough to see the Red Sox win the World Series. He assured me that I would. Uh, I will say at least the Sox are still the reigning World Series champions, although bowing an act of God that will not last for much longer. <laughs> All right, so when you give talks, it becomes a business expense. So this is a Wally that we got from going to Fenway Park. Try to work you know, your you know, personal life into your work life if you can. If you can enjoy what you're doing, and some of you are looking for these things called jobs in the near future, it makes it so much better. So if you can find something that you're passionate about, if you can find a way to work it into different spheres of your life, go for it. Okay. Out of curiosity, how many of you have heard of the Pythagorean one last theorem? All right, so there's two of us and one of them is the lecturer. All right. <laughs> so the goal is to give a derivation of the one loss formula. We're going to observe ideas and techniques of model. And that's one of the skills I want you to get out of this class, is how do you take a real world problem, create a mathematical model, and then do something with it? You know, how do you gather statistics to analyze it, to evaluate, to, or to find the values of the parameters, we're going to see how advanced theory enters in simple problems. Uh, how many of you remember the drowning swimmer problem from calculus? There's a swimmer who's drowning in the water, and the lifeguard has to get to the swimmer as fast as possible. The lifeguard runs at one speed on land, one speed in water, and it's actually the same as physics in going from one medium to another. Now, in real world, will you have the lifeguard sit down and say, just a second, and take out a piece of paper she starts doing or he starts doing the calculus? No. Now, we'll also assume that there's nobody on the beach so that the lifeguard doesn't have to worry about you know, running into people. What do you think most lifeguards will do? What path will they take? Direct. Yeah, direct. Yeah. It's not the optimal path, but it misses by a small amount, and it's not a bad thing to just do something quickly rather than spend a lot of time and do something better, but, oh, the person died, but yes, but now I know how to reach you. So... Very similar to that, if you do that problem, if you remember that problem, it's a very simple problem to state, but you have to find the solution to a quarter. And so some advanced math actually enters very quickly. We'll see that happens in real world problems as well. There are also a lot of opportunities for inefficiencies. If you've ever read the book Moneyball or other books like that, I'm actually debating changing and pulling some topics from the course and moving some of that stuff uh, and from other books by Michael Lewis into this course to just have some good problems to think about. And then the last is if you are interested in research, I actually do work with some students on campus on applying sabermetrics either to lawsuits or to just fun projects. Okay, so the goal is to find a good statistic to describe the real world. Anybody know what bridge this is? Yes, this is the Harvard Bridge. <laughs> this is not a hard question, okay. So this is the Harvard Bridge. It measures about 620.1 meters. But there's another way to measure its length. How many of you have heard of the SMUT? It's one of the greatest units of measurements. So the bridge is 364.1, and I love this, plus or minus one year. And so a fraternity at MIT was wondering, you know, we've got a bunch of freshman pledges. I wonder, if we were to take this pledge and match them down, how many times would we have to pick him up to measure the whole bridge? And so they put down little markers every time they picked him up and put him down. The police in Cambridge did not find this amusing, and they had the markings erased. Well, that wasn't going to deter the fraternity. Mr. Spoon, we need you again. And so this went on for a while, and then eventually the police threw up their arms in frustration. The city gave up, and the Spoon markers stayed. And then it starts to take a life of its own. And now they actually have put in Spoon markers on the bridge. And when there is a car accident, they actually tell you the Spoon location where the collision happened. We will meet Smoot again later at the end of the talk. 
So I want to talk about to find the right statistics. This is sadly uh, data from June 4th, 2018. Depending on which web page you go to, there's a different team in first place in the American League East. They have the same number of games played, they have the same outcomes, but one has the Red Sox in first, the other has the Yankees. Now clearly the one on the left, which has the Red Sox in first, is correct. But it comes down to, are you looking at winning percentage of games back? And depending on how you calculate things, because the two teams haven't played the same number of games. So what this tells you is that some of these statistics that are being used may not be the best statistic. All right. So the goal is to go from this. This is one of the first teams where I was the head coach. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but one of the coaches is not wearing a green shirt. It was digitally altered. This leads to a talk on benefits law of how can you detect different types of fraud. I will not say which uh, uh, shirt was altered. There is Kayla in the front. So to go from this to a little bit better team, to a little better team with medals now, to actually having a World Series championship ring. So I actually did wear a Red Sox championship ring for a short amount of time. I will not say what I offered to keep it. I will say I still have my wedding ring and my first one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so numerical observation. So we need parameters to describe what's going on. So RS observed is the average number of runs scored per game, RA, average number of runs, and gamma is some parameter constant for score. Baseball will be different in scoring than basketball will be different than football, okay? And what Bill James numerically observed is that a team's winning percentage, number of wins divided by number of games, is extremely well modeled by runs scored to the gamma over runs scored to the gamma plus runs allowed to the gamma. And when he first did this, he took gamma to be two, now we think that in baseball, the best value is around 1.82. But two is not bad. It does a pretty good job. Anybody have a guess why he called this the Pythagorean one loss formula? One squared squared over one squared squared plus one allowed squared. Why is he calling it Pythagoras? Where do you think the name comes from? Get the old Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared is C squared for a right triangle. You know, baseball's played on a diamond. You know, yes, you have the triangle in Fenway Park in the outfield, but it's just a good name. It's, you know, he's seen sums of squares before. This is the level of mathematics. Now, the question is, why is this true? So, you know, as an example, in 2009, the Sox went 95 and 67, scored 872 runs, allowed 736 for prediction of 93.4. <laughs> so, that's pretty good. Right? Are you convinced? Why, why aren't you convinced? It's really good. It's one data point. It's more than just that it's one data point. So this is a really important moment in your education. It's a really good data point, right? 95, 92.4, that's pretty close. Why aren't you convinced? It's more than just one data point. So I am selectively leaking to you today a, a team from 2009. What team do you think I would choose to leak? If I'm trying to convince you that this method is good. Uh, you think so? Yeah, I'm choosing the team. I'm telling you in 2009, this is how the Red Sox said. Now, if I really want to, I would actually have had a pause and not have the Yankees stuff showing right now. Because you can see right now the Yankees are very different. But if someone is giving you information, you always want to, so why are you giving me this information as opposed to other information? Can I see all the sources, please? I'd like to see everything. I don't want to just see what you're choosing. So I'm cherry picking over here. But I can kind of justify it by saying, well, you know, I'm a Red Sox fan. So that's why I chose the Red Sox. And then your response is, okay, Professor Miller, and why did you choose 2009? <laughs> right? There's a lot of things I can do, and there's a lot of things you can do with statistics to manipulate people or to catch people being manipulated. It depends who's paying you. Okay? Both avenues are, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So for the Yankees, they were predicted to be 95.2, and they actually went 103. So one of the reasons people like the statistic is it also, it, it often gives a sense of what kind of job is the manager doing? Is he getting more from the team? Than you he's squeezing out some more wins. 
Uh, for those of you who here is a Red Sox fan, and we're not talking about the 2011 season. All right. So three big areas: extrapolation, evaluation, and an advantage. And if you do not like baseball, you could always do this for other things such as economics. You know, trying to figure out what's a good stock, a company, mutual fund to invest in. So a lot of times you look halfway through a season and try to predict who is your real threat. Is your team overperforming or underperforming? Do you still have a chance? Uh, a couple of years ago, it was really good. The Yankees started off 21 and 29. They were having a bad season. But all the metrics said the Yankees were underperforming and having bad luck. And the Yankees decided to make some moves, spent a lot of money, and made the playoffs. Other times you might say, this is just not our year. You know, we're 21 and 29. We should really only have 18 wins. Let's not get rid of our good young prospects and try to get an old power hitter for just one season. Let's conserve for next year. Another, as I mentioned, was evaluation. See, is the manager able to do a good job with what he has or not? And then the other thing is, and this is less of an advantage now in the, in the era of computers, this is an easy statistic to use. It only depends on two parameters, really. You know, the run scored, runs allowed, and then some constant gamma for the league. It allows me to make closed form predictions. If I increase my team's one production by 10%, or I decrease the pitching, uh, number of runs allowed by 10%, I can actually get some measurement of how much that will affect my winning percentage. Now, in the era of computers, statistics that are easy to use are less and less important. Who here is a football fan? I expect at least one hand to go up. Uh, can you just find the quarterback rating or the quarterback rating scheme? The QBR? Yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, it's pretty complex. It's pretty complex, but can you tell what a good number is? Like one thirty. Yeah. So, but, but I'm saying it's very complicated. But anybody who works in the subject, you know, if you see score one thirty, one forty, you know, the maximum is I think like one fifty two. Oh, it's one fifty eight. Yeah. Okay. One fifty eight point six. And so, you can it's calibrated roughly. So I think a hundred is an okay game. Yeah. You know, sixty is like Jets. Fifty is Bills. <laughs> no, actually, Bills actually did this year. Uh, there was one year where the Jets quarterback was so bad in the game. He was two for eight with three interceptions. If you put the other team, he would have been three for eight and two interceptions. And his quarterback rating would have actually gone up. <laughs> but it's a very complicated formula that takes into account you know, your completion percentage, how many touchdowns you have, how many interceptions, how much yardage people get from the plays, how many attempts. And so it has all these things, which is great, but you don't really need to understand all of them. You can just get to the point where it's now been calibrated. So you see something above 100, it's a good game. You see something below 100, not as good. So it's not as essential nowadays that we have simple formulas because the computers can do a lot of these crunches for us. So for instance, when you are looking at how good of a hitter is, you have to take into account what ballpark do they play in. So if you play in Coors Field when the first one online, they didn't have anything to adjust for the fact that it was a mile high. And hitters were thrilled because a lot of balls that would have been outs were now actually able to clear the field and become home runs. Now they have what's called the humidor, which can make the balls a little bit deader. And there's a lot of interesting things you could do, but I will not say it with the uh, camera report. All right, so basic probability. So one is we've already seen. <coughs> so the goal is we observe some kind of scoring distribution and we want to come up with a way to model it. So I've already told you, what is the big lie from Calc 2? What do you leave Calc 2 thinking you can do, but you can't? You can't integrate, right? We have to be extremely careful to give you a function that you can integrate in closed form. Fortunately, there's a lot of functions that we can't integrate in closed form that have very different shapes. And we can typically use these to approximate pretty well what's going on in the real world. I do not think one of the nice fundamental distributions perfectly models in your real world scoring, but I think it does a good enough job. So as always, X is a mean of variable density P of X, it's non-negative, it integrates to one, the probability between A and B is the area under the curve of A to B, the mean is the average value of the integral of X P of X, the variance is how spread out it is X minus mu squared, and independence knowledge of one mean variable gives no knowledge of the other. So here are the two guidelines for modeling. I'll assume nobody has ever watched the old Charlie Brown baseball. He never has a good game. So the model should capture the key features of the system, and the model should be mathematically tractable or solvable. 
What's the problem with these two goals? They're like opposing. Yeah, they're opposing. Right. The more things you capture, the harder the model is going to be. So this is when you have to be really, really thinking. Do I truly need to put this in the model? How important is it? How much is it going to change the answer? Is this truly a key feature? So did I talk about Galileo's experiment where he dropped the two spheres from the Tower of Pisa? Okay. How many of you have heard of this experiment? And one of the most famous to show that the mass does not affect how long it takes, right? Does anybody remember the color of the two spheres? I'm oh, sorry? We know the color. No, we don't. Oh. <laughs> does it matter what the color is? The only way it could possibly matter is maybe one was black, one was white. It was a hot, sunny day. They were sitting outside for seven hours, and now one of them is significantly warmer than the other. And so maybe as they're dropping, the heat could actually have some impact. But if they were both inside and they're both at the same temperature, then the color shouldn't matter, and that should not be a feature of the model. But maybe the temperature of the sphere should be. So you want to figure out what really matters. So here's a possible model. One squared runs a lot of independent random variables, and there's some probability density functions for one squared runs a lot. So this is what I am proposing to you. And I just look at the clock and see how much time I have for you to find flaws in this model. So can you give me a reason why one squared and runs a lot might be independent? It might not be. It might not be. Uh, well, if you give up a lot of um, Okay, okay, so if you give up a lot of runs, it could get inside your head. What else could happen if you give up a lot of runs? You're a bad team at the end of your time, scores more Well, but, maybe, but th that could just be taken into account by the fact that you might have a run production density that's low. But imagine what you're giving up a lot of runs one day. What might you do now as the manager of a team that's given up a lot of runs? Okay, so who would you put into pitch now after you've given up a lot of runs? Are you going to put in one of your good pitches or are you going to put in one of your bad pitches? A bad one. So the Red Sox made a trade for Eric Gagne. Uh, he used to be decent, but when he came to the Sox, he was just terrible. And it got to the point where they could only use him when the game was quite a lot of time a lot to just eat up innings. You might also take out some of your good hitters and say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Today's not our day. Let's give some of the younger kids some practice time. Years ago, the Sox had a pitcher named, I, I believe it was Remlinger, and he came in one day in the ninth inning, and the Sox were up 10 to 3. So he just has to get three outs. And normally they give you the ERA of the pitcher when the pitcher comes in. That's how many runs they give up every nine innings. But they didn't. They just gave three dashes. And the reason was while he had pitched for the Sox and while he had given up runs for the Sox, and they got anybody out for the Sox. And so this would be a division by zero problem, and the networks did not have the plus infinity sign available. So they just did three dashes. He proceeds to give up a grand slam. He does get the three outs. He actually creates a safe situation. <laughs> and so there's a lot of reasons why these may not be independent. But there's another big reason. So who are my Sox fans here? Any Red Sox fans? And nobody even thinking, huh, my professor's a Sox fan. Yeah, I'm a Sox fan today. <laughs> uh, so they still talk about the Mother's Day miracle game in the early 2000s, probably around 2005, 2006. Going into the bottom of the ninth at Fenway Park in Boston, the Sox are down five to nothing to the Orioles. What can you tell me about the final score of the game? Just from that, we know like it's at least five to nothing. I can't go down. Right, so the Orioles scored at least five and the Red Sox scored at least zero. But there's something else we know. Probably because I'm telling the story. And it's called the Mother's Day Miracle. So something's got to be happening. But there's something we know about baseball scores that is different from scores in, say, football or hockey or soccer. I don't know. It's near the bottom of the ninth inning. You get that first. Once you get the lead. Once you get the lead, you win. So that will give you some stop. You know, you're never going to win if you're the home team by more than four. Years. You could hit a grand slam. But more importantly, what do you know about the number, the difference between the Orioles score and the Red Sox score? Well, what about at least? It's at least at the end of the game. 
least one? It's at least one. You can't have a tying baseball. We do not have enough time in this class to explain why it would be a catastrophe for a baseball game to end in a tie. But the commissioner has declared that this will not happen. And none of you, and hopefully your children and your children's children, will have to watch a baseball game ending in a tie. Wait, so what happens if, like... We play on. Oh, so more innings. Oh, yes, you have extra innings. And there are games that have gone to 18, 19, 20 innings, 30 innings. The game will not end until somebody wins. You're in tennis. Uh, Wimbledon does not believe it is fair to decide a fifth set by a tiebreak game. You have to win by two games. And so Professor Lepp, who's also a tennis fan, she and I were basically years ago going back and forth to department meetings colloquia and checking in on this Mama Disney game, which was finally decided 71 to 69 in the fifth set. And of course, the winner was destroyed the next day from being so exhausted. But baseball games can't end in a tie, so you have some information. You know these scores can't be independent because they can't end in a tie. This is actually what got me on the radar screen of some major league franchises, is my analysis actually took into account, these are called structural zeros, if any of you have seen R by C contingency tables in the stats class, where certain outcomes are not available. And there's some advanced data here, which if you're interested, is worth looking into. It's sometimes used in hospitals. The assumption is if you bring someone sick to a hospital and they get treatment, what can you say about them afterwards? Well, that's the goal is they should feel better, but at a minimum, they should not be worse. Not be worse. Okay. For the most part, you hope that this, the doctors do not make somebody worse. There's the occasion, oh, you were supposed to remove the left one. <laughs> oh, <yeah. coughs> or you have the wrong chart, which sadly does happen. But for a lot of medical analysis, you assume that the doctors are not going to be making things worse, and that certain states are not accessible, and that we calculate certain probabilities of things. So we want to calculate the probability that you win. So you score F, you allow G. So let's say we have the continuous and the integral on the left, and then the discrete on the right. So on the right, you know, I score I runs, I allow J, and I sum over all I and J where J is less than I. Or I choose an X and a Y, and I integrate over all pairs where Y is less than equal to X. Now, what's nice is the probability that x equals y is zero in a double integral, so it doesn't really matter. Which do you think is a better model for baseball, the discrete or the continuous? Discrete. discrete. Yeah. Is there a chance of seeing the headline, Sox rally in ninth, beat Yankees by score of pi to e? <laughs> I'd love to see that headline on so many levels, but we're not going to see that. Do you think we should use discrete or continuous? I remember you saying that discrete is usually a lot more difficult. Yeah, we don't really have as much nice formulas for sums of discrete, but we do for integrals. So we're going to use we're going to use the continuous case. So we're reduced to calculating, and then you know I mentioned earlier some of the problems with the models. You know, we know they're not independent of unscored, uh, and then if we actually want to do this. What are the formulas? What are the densities? And can the integral be done in closed form? So here's the uniform distribution on 0, 10. This is one possible way to model baseball scores. It just doesn't correspond to reality. Anybody have another thought as to what we could try? Another nice distribution, one of our famous fun distributions. Yeah. OK, you're jumping a little bit ahead. Normal. normal. Excellent. <laughs> normal. Now, there's a problem with the normal distribution. As bad as some teams are, there are some teams that are quite bad, it's unlikely you're going to score a negative number of runs. <laughs> I actually do have a screenshot where ESPN had a little bug and had a team that actually had a negative run total in a game. But you're not going to score a negative number of runs. Now, there's another problem with this is that it actually assigns a positive probability to scoring, say, a quadrillion runs. But the probability is so small, it is more likely that each one of us in this room will win the lottery, and I will be rooting for the Yankees in the World Series. And you all win the lottery again, and I root for the Giants to beat the Patriots on Thursday. 
than to score a trillion months. So I'm not really worried about those probabilities. I would much rather have something going off to infinity that's easy to work with. And again, the probability is so small, but it makes the intervals nice and close. All right, so because the normal has issues, you need to give me a nice, another nice simple function. So your function is a nice one. It's just a little bit too advanced right now. Any other nice one we could check? There would be only positive values. It would be decreasing as we go higher up. I'm sorry? Um, close to the Poisson. The, the continuous version would be like the exponential. So it's, it's basically like a continuous version of Poisson. Now, the problem with this is it assigns too much probability to small events and not enough to large events. So similar to what you said, we're going to look at the three parameter wide zone. And the more parameters you have, the more flexible your distribution is. So the wide zone has alpha, beta, and gamma. All beta does is it just translates where the zero point is. If you were modeling a basketball game, nobody's going to score less than 20 points in a basketball game. In the problem. Probably even nobody less than 40 points. Now, in football and soccer and baseball, you can't have zero score. It turns out it's nice to make beta to be minus a half because you want the scores centered on the bins. If you have your bins zero to one, one to two, two to three, then a score of one is right on the boundary of two bins. It's much better to have the bins go from negative a half to one half, and then zero is right in the middle. One half to three halves, one is right in the middle. Alpha is like a rescale. Think of it as meters versus yards versus whatever. All of this is in rescales or units. Gamma is the real one that matters. Gamma is the shape, and it changes how things look. So here's a couple of different choices. So the red is the exponential. Green is the parameters 1, 0, 2. And the other ones, you know, basically, we can change where the bump is. We can change how big the bump is. These basically go up and then come down, except for the exponential, which just goes down. And so there's a lot of things in life that are described by this. It often occurs in survival analysis, when gamma is less than one, it's a high infant mortality rate. When gamma is greater than one, you actually have the aging process and people can survive a long period of time. You can use this to model how long is a movie going to be popular? How long is a song going to be popular? How long is a lecture going to be popular? Right. I'm hoping we're in high gamma today, but we'll see. Now we can introduce some nice functions. We've seen the gamma function before. It's a generalization of the factorial function. So gamma of s, is the integral of e to the minus u, u to the s to u over u. Uh, gamma of n is n minus one factorial. And what's nice is that if a variable has parameters alpha, beta, and gamma, we have closed form expressions for the mean and the variance in terms of alpha, beta, and gamma. We can calculate the mean and the variance easily. So I'm going to just plug the calculation over here. We'll do another one in greater detail, but just briefly, let's say we want to calculate the mean. So we have x times the probability distribution. How do you do calculations like this? You listen to what it's saying. Oh, look, we have an x minus beta over alpha. We have an x. So let's subtract beta, divide by alpha, multiply by alpha, and then add beta. Well, when we add beta, well, then that hits a probability distribution. That's going to just be 1. And now this over here, let's call this u. And we get u to the 1 over gamma e to the minus u. When you just play a little bit with the algebra, you see it's a gamma function. And you get a nice, beautiful expression. So if you can get a closed form expression for means and variances, that's wonderful. So this is a snapshot of, maybe it's MLB.com, I forget where I grabbed it from. Real estate on web pages is precious. You don't put things up there just because you want to. You put things up there because people care about it or they're giving you money, which makes you care about it. So what statistics do they give you here? Well, they give you the team name, that's kind of important. They give you how many wins and losses they have. Do they need to give you the winning percentage? No, we can do the calculation, but people, you know, do you want the American public dividing? <laughs> yeah, let's just give the winning percentage. And you know, people can interpret those numbers much faster than they can just wins and losses. How many games back are you? Well, you could always do the subtraction. It's not quite as bad as the division, but let's just give people that. You can look at how they've done on their last 10, what kind of streak they're on. People often like to know something like that. Uh, INT, it's not interceptions, it's interleague play. They record at home, they record on the road. Well, technically, if we know the home record, we know the road record, but you know, let's put it there. And then you have the XWL. That's the expected one loss. That's the Pythagorean prediction. So on websites, I guess it's one of the things that they think is truly valuable and worth including. I'm going to skip this stuff over here, but I will just quickly go through it so that if you ever pause the slides, you can see it. Okay. And so here's the Pythagorean one loss theorem. That if we assume one scored and one's allowed, 
uh, independent mean variables drawn from variables, I'm going to assume they have the same beta and the same gamma, but different alphas, then the probability that you win is your one squared minus beta to the gamma over one squared to the minus beta to the gamma plus one's allowed minus beta to the gamma. So it basically proves the Pythagorean formula. We take beta to be minus a half, and we can calculate everything beautifully. So here's a sketch of how you would prove it. So x and y will be our independent random variables. x will be how much we score. y will be how much we allow. We observe a mean number of one squared and one's allowed. And so we can use that to figure out what alpha is as a function of beta and gamma. And so all we have to do now is calculate the probability that x is greater than y. So we have a double integral to do. So for those of you who have taken multivariable calculus, which would be everybody here, here is an application of multivariable calculus. And it's an application in probability, which is even better because that's what I'm supposed to be teaching you, right? We have to do this double integral. Well, this is a nice double integral. Uh, it's you know, two rectangular things, great. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time on this because I want to give you some ideas of how to do difficult integrals. So the first thing is we do the y integral first. All right, well, one of the things that's nice about the y distribution, and that's why it's gamma to the minus one and gamma, is it's set up so it's easy to integrate. That's where these parameters come from. So we get a nice close form. We now get one minus blah. Well, the one times the probability distribution just integrates to one, and now we're left with blah. Now the problem here is we have an e to the negative x over alpha rs and an e to the negative x over alpha ra. They're not the same, so we can't just combine them. But we can do one over alpha to the gamma is one over alpha rs to the gamma plus one over alpha ra to the gamma and we choose alpha like that, we can combine the two exponentials. Has anybody seen this before? Where you combine something by saying the reciprocal is the sum of the two reciprocals. Where have you seen this? I think that's like the harmonic mean. So it is the harmonic mean, but there's physical situations where it arises. So if you've taken physics, there are two places where you should have seen this. I believe it's still a current topic in physics. Oh, the, is it the resistance? Yeah, so I was trying to give a hint. Right? <laughs> you know, I, I always forget if it's resistors in series or resistors in parallel, but when you add up the resistors in one of those two configurations, the resistance of the combined is related like this. It also occurs in some center of mass. So by looking at it like this, we actually now have a nice integral that we can do. So it's not perfect because when we look over here, we have an alpha RS and we want an alpha. But we can fix that by just multiplying. So again, you can just go home and look at this carefully if you want to see how the integration is done. But it becomes very nice if we just rescale things. And when the dust settles, we end up getting the relationship we want. So it works out very nicely. And so I published this a couple of years ago. I've extended this with a bunch of students over the years. So let's choose a season completely at random. Let's take 2004, okay? So here is the run scored and runs allowed for the Red Sox, as well as the best prediction. And what I'm doing is I'm going to use the method of maximum likelihood. You can also use the method of least squares. How many of you have been in a statistics class where you've done this? Okay, so I will focus on you right now. <laughs> no, so I'm just saying, so you've seen stuff like this before. You have choices as to how you want to find what's the best fit. Later in the semester, we will actually talk about the method of least squares. Uh, I, I like that a little more the method of maximum likelihood because I can justify for you why you spend so much time learning some material in previous classes. When you look at the data, do you think it's a good fit or a bad fit? It's not horrible. It's not perfect. Is this in the realm of what should be considered a good fit for statistics? We need ways to quantify other than just visually how does it look. And so there's something called a chi-squared test, which we'll talk about in greater detail later after we've talked about chi-squared random variables, which not surprisingly play a key role in the chi-squared test. But there's a way to quantify how good is the fit. And so the method of these squares that we'll do is we'll let bin k be the kth bin We'll look at how many times we observe a value in that bin versus how much we predict it. And then we look at the sum of squares. And the smaller this quantity is, then the closer our prediction is to our here. And since we're squaring things, it magnifies errors. 
So it would be much better to have a couple of medium errors than a lot of small errors in one gigantic error. And that is a drawback of the method. And so when we do this, you know, here's the plot of the Red Sox. I'm choosing them first, even though they didn't have the most wins in the regular season, because they did win the World Series in 2004, proving that my great uncle was not a liar. What about the Yankees? Good fit, bad fit. Eh, looks okay. What about the Baltimore Orioles? Yeah, but the problem is you talk about games that you're scoring six runs versus seven runs. And so if you, this is one of the problems when data is really compressed and the number of observations you have. What about the Tampa Bay Devil Rays? They were the Devil Rays back then. They seem to do a really nice job on that exponential or beyond exponential decay. I mean, I don't know if they get any math lessons in the dugout. <laughs> they didn't have a great baseball season on the standard metric of wins, but if you look at you know, how well the Weibull is modeling your behavior, they did much better than the teams that got to go to the playoffs. What about the Toronto Blue Jays? Okay, so I'm finally hearing no's. Well, what do you have to remember about Toronto? They're Canadian. <laughs> Are there any Canadians here? So they do things differently. They use the metric system. Okay, no, that has absolutely nothing to do. With, absolutely nothing to do with baseball. Remember how I talked earlier about selectively leaking the 2009 Red Sox record? If all of the data is good, should you be suspicious? Some of the data should actually be bad. You know, if you flip, well, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but if the data is too good for too long, you should be a little concerned. So here's the advance there, which is about to get to. Later today, imagine you're in another class which is not as exciting because it's not talking about probability in baseball. And so you get bored. And so you decide to flip a fair coin a million times and record the results. You are a phenomenal flipper, okay? And you're able to do this in a 50 minute class window. You can even calculate how many flips do you have to do in a second this to be happening. You expect about 500,000 hits. Would you be shocked if you got 501,216 hits? Does that seem reasonable? How about 512,018 hits? 542,399 hits? 590,008 hits? So where is that threshold? About 95% of the time, you're actually going to be within 1,000. So all the numbers I've given you are actually already unlikely. There's an advantage to knowing that we are talking. <laughs> this is the central limit then, and we'll talk about this in greater detail as to how close do you expect something to be to the mean. So 95% of the time, you should be within 1,000. What if you do this 400 times and you're always within 1,000? Would you be surprised? If you do it 400 times, you would expect to have, what, about 20 times outside and none of them were outside? I'd be a little suspicious. So here's a little experiment. Imagine we do it n times. So if n equals 5, then 22.62% of the time, uh, at least one of the set is not going to work. Okay, let me show you this correctly. So what is the probability that at least one of the set is outside is more than a thousand away. So if you flip it five times, you have a 22% chance that at least one value is outside. If you flip it 14 times, which was the number of teams I think you have believe back then, it's a 51% chance. If you flipped it 50 times, you already have a 92% chance that at least one value is outside. So when you're looking at data, if the data is too good too long, either it's a beautiful, perfect theory, and you know, Fibonacci numbers will actually give an example for that for Benford later in the semester, or there might be something else going on. And so when you look at the results, I'm not going to say exactly what a chi-square test is. Who knows a chi-square test? Right, so one person. So the critical threshold is 95% of the time, we should have for 20 degrees of freedom, a 31.41, 97% time about 37.5. And we're seeing that almost everything is good, but the Toronto Blue Jays at 41.18, they were the largest one, they were the most they were the furthest away from a good fit. There's an advanced thing called the Bonferroni adjustment, which says, well, when you're doing multiple comparisons, you have to expand your 
region a little bit because you expect unlikely events to happen the more times you do things. And there's a huge issue, and I was just talking with a colleague in psychology about this, about can you trust experiments in social science journals where a lot of these experiments cannot be replicated. And people cherry pick which of their experiments to report in the literature. You know, oh, look, I've got four things that confirm my theory. Oh, those other seven experiments? Oh, no, 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 those were completely different. And there's a real danger in what people report. If you do those adjustments for the fact that, look, we're looking at 14 teams now, shouldn't at least one or two of the teams be a little bit larger? Then the critical threshold becomes 41.14. 41.1, that, that's essentially then where you would expect. So I actually think it's good that the data is not perfect here. But it's really showing that something is going on. And this is what I mentioned before, I'm not gonna go into details, but when you're doing these comparisons, it's called structural zeros. It's a beautiful theory to take into account this. So you know, looking back at the data, you know, from 2004, I calculated what the best value of gamma was for each team. We looked at how many games they were predicted to win, and we compare that to how many they actually won. So if I really want to convince you, I would do the Cleveland Indians, who were predicted to win 80 games and won 80 games. <laughs> in, again, most metrics, it's a mediocre season, but in terms of you know, meeting your expectations, beautifully done. You know, the Yankees incredibly overperformed. The Red Sox even overperformed. I think most games are within around four but you can't have large fluctuations, and this is where a lot of times the manager is given credit or blame. And you see the best values of gamma are pretty reasonable. You know, the mean is 1.74, the median 1.76, the standard deviation 0 0.06. This is pretty much in line with what you would expect from a 1.82 value. And this is with a very simple model. Uh, anybody remember the 2000 presidential election? What was the big snafu in 2000? Okay, but what did they do wrong in Florida? They did something that, they, that was illegal. No. No, the, the ballots were legal. They, were, they might have been confusing, but they were legal. Nope. They called Florida while voting was still happening. Florida is not all in the Eastern time zone. The panhandle is off by 30 minutes. And, there was, and the panhandle is more Republican. Now the people who were there, they heard, oh, it's been called for Gore. My vote doesn't matter, they went home. That's their fault. If they chose not to vote, they chose not to vote. But you are not supposed to call anything for a state while the voting is going on. Well, most of the time though, you know, it's not so bad. And a lot of times you will see the blue states and the red states called, you know, within seconds of when the polls close. You know, there's no real debate as to what's gonna happen in California or in uh, New York. What if we did the same to a baseball game? You know, after seven innings, the Sox are leading 14 to one, we're gonna call the game for the Red Sox. Yes, it's possible that the other team might come back, but if we call some baseball games early, then what we're gonna say is, look, they're putting in Remlinger, okay? They probably don't really care at all about holding the other team. You know, we shouldn't really count those points. And can we use this to adjust our prediction of how many points are you truly allowing versus how many points do you care about allowing? Uh, the Patriots have played a lot of weak teams this year, which is nice for the Patriots. The team that scored the most against the Patriots was who? You know? Nope. Nope. Jets. Jets scored 14 points. Patriots were up, I believe, 30 to zero. And then they said, all right, let's see how some of the other people can do. And they sat down the offense. They, and then there was a botched punt, which the Jets recovered and won, ran in for a touchdown. And then they put in the backup or the backup backup quarterback who threw an interception, which was returned for a touchdown. And so after the Jets scored 14 points, it was like, okay, guys, good job. Okay, starters, you're back on the field. <laughs> you know, those 14 points shouldn't really count against the Patriots. When you consider that they've allowed 34 points this season and 14 of them were when they weren't really trying, you know, it gets you some incredible value of what their defense is. But you want to make sure you're looking at the right statistics. So when you're putting in weaker pitchers or weaker hitters, you're, you're a hitter and the other team has put in a weak pitcher and now you're getting a lot of hits and runs, 
you want to be very careful to give those the correct weight. So I've actually done some continuations of this stuff with some of my students, and we've actually looked to see how much does it change things. Fortunately, with 162 games, it doesn't really change things that much. This is the nice thing about baseball, you have very large data sets. You can look at other sports. Other sports will have different gammas, but stuff like this is going to still follow. Football is more interesting because in football, the NFL, you can often clinch your seeding if you're the best team with two games left in the season. In which case you then sit a lot of your starters often because you don't want injuries. Really bad analysis where they've penalized teams for losing games that don't matter. Now, we have about a minute or two left. This is a chance for me to end with one of the points I try to make all the time to my students. Seize opportunities. You never know where it will lead. If you do not feel that I know you well enough to write a letter of recommendation for you, get to know me. You say, I like to go for a walk, I like to grab a coffee, I like to have lunch. Not, not today, it's going to be but um, on most days. Make sure I know you so that if you need a letter, I can write one. Or if I'm aware of opportunities, hey, that would be a good fit for so-and-so. So who was the person I mentioned earlier today? Smoot. Anybody know what happened to Smoot? He could have kicked and screamed when the fraternity brothers decided to turn him into a unit of measurement. He rolled with the punches. Do you think this helped his life? Do you think it hurt his life? <laughs> Close. He became the chair of the American National Statistics Institute. You can't make this up. I'm just imagining the interview process. But for those of you who are going to be in the someday, well, you know, I don't like to brag too often, but I am a unit of measurement. <laughs> and so you go with things, and you, what has happened to you? How can you use it? So later in life, you will learn. Crap, Professor Miller was telling so many jokes, I didn't really learn something that I should have learned. Oh, here it is in the book or online, 10 seconds done, great. You, know, you don't need to learn tremendous numbers of facts, especially in the 21st century. When I was young, we had these things called reference books, and it was expensive. Now you can just do a quick Google search. So in terms of actual content, it's fine to do a little bit less. What's really important is learning how to think about problems. And it's what I really want to emphasize in this class. And I want to emphasize, this is why I have you speak up. And if you make a comment, please email me. I want you to get to the point where you are comfortable speaking. A lot of students are not. And in fact, a former student told me he'd gone to the talk with Steve Case, Williams class of 80, billionaire, founder of America Online. I said, yeah, actually, I was comfortable talking to him. Thank you for you giving me those kicks. You know, all those years ago. And I really want you to get into this mindset that you have things worth saying and that you're comfortable saying them. All right, that is a good place to stop.